On our broadcast tonight, what's the truth? If some are saying the economy has turned the corner and some can't get off the mat financially while others are angry enough to shout about it. Star Wars, the fight over America's future role in space between those who fund it and those who've done it. The first lady in a new role, and we'll hear from her tonight. Growth industry, we might be a big step closer tonight to what so many consider the holy grail, keeping what's up top. And Richard Engel reports tonight on a major reversal for the U.S. in Afghanistan. Nightly news begins now. From NBC News World Headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams. Good evening. Sometimes, as you know, it's as if there are two or more Americas and at least that many economies. What you're about to hear are some pretty positive economic indicators, and they may not match. In fact, they probably won't match what most folks are experiencing. In fact, part two of our lead story tonight has to do with the anger across the country. Some of it focused at the two big political parties is enough to make people march on Boston. First, the good news, which, if true, will be felt eventually. We begin tonight with NBC's Mike Taibbi. He's live on Wall Street in New York. Mike, good evening. Good evening, Brian. You know, by some of the numbers, the economy looks better today than it has since it all began turning sour two summers ago, but only by some of the numbers. Wall Street's close had a Dow above 11,100, more than 70% of the way back from its Great Recession low in March 2009. And President Obama emerged from a meeting with congressional leaders to push for new financial regulations to prevent another near crash. We cannot have a circumstance in which a meltdown in the financial sector once again puts the entire economy in peril. Today's news, though, a good enough month in corporate earnings that some bellwether companies announced they are hiring. Intel to hire one to 2,000 workers, and J.P. Morgan as many as 9,000. And consumer spending jumped 1.6% in March, well above what was expected, led by car sales and spending on clothing and building materials, an unmistakable trend for a key indicator that drives 70% of the economy. Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke. Consumer spending continued to increase in the first two months of this year and has now risen at an annual rate of about 2.5% in real terms since the middle of 2009. All of which has a number of experts on the verge of saying a corner has been turned. I think we're in the middle of a recovery that may actually turn out to be stronger than an awful lot of the initial forecasters would have thought. But not every economist is sold. We still have a lot of hurdles. Not only is unemployment still extremely high, but we also are facing many consumers that have been unemployed for a very long time. And even Wall Streeters visiting the local cobbler. It's too early to say. In, in, in my heart, I want them to improve, but it, I think it is a little early. Are nowhere near ready to pronounce the Great Recession history. Okay. And tomorrow, and typically, there'll be some numbers that will likely temper most of today's optimism. The housing foreclosure numbers will be announced, and they're not likely to tell a story that's in any way encouraging. Brian? Mike Taibbi starting us off from Wall Street here in New York tonight. Mike, thanks. And now to the anger. The Tea Party movement, for one, sparked by foreclosures, job losses, Wall Street bailouts, and in some cases, just plain politics. Today, they held a party in the original Tea Party city of Boston. A lot of anger was coming from the podium at the rally, and one of the featured speakers, Sarah Palin, our own Rahima Ellis, is with us now from Boston Common. Rahima, good evening. Good evening, Brian. In this city where the American revolutionary spirit was born some 200 years ago, Sarah Palin and the Tea Party movement found a warm welcome. This is about the people. This is the people's movement. The megastar of the conservative movement rallied thousands of Tea Party supporters on Boston Common demanding change. We need to cut taxes so that our families can keep more of what we earn and produce. And our mom and pops then our small businesses can reinvest according to our own priorities and hire more people. At the event, one of 20 on the Tea Party Express tour, Palin blasted what she calls big government. Is this what their change is all about? I want to tell them, nah, you know, we will keep clinging to our constitution and our guns and religion and you can keep the change. 
Many at the rally say they're frustrated. I'm not a racist. I'm not a moron. I'm not stupid. I am a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, a nice person who pays taxes. Too many taxes. Have you looked at the debt clock lately? It's, it's, it's enormous. Everybody's taking us to the same place. It's just the party in power now is taking us there faster. While rallies like this one tap into a growing sentiment of discontent about government, an underlying question here is what does the future hold for its keynoter, Sarah Palin? Since resigning as Alaska's governor, Palin has reportedly earned $12 million on book deals, speaking engagements, and TV ventures. Sarah Palin certainly hasn't ruled out a 2012 run, but she's made a lot of money since she resigned as governor of Alaska, and chances are she's not ready to give that up right now. We need for now, Palin is continuing her campaign with Tea Party supporters and gearing up for election season. So folks, from now until November, when they say, yes, we can, we're going to all say, oh, no, you don't. One high-profile Republican not among the thousands out here today, freshman Massachusetts Senator Scott Brown, who pundits say is keeping his distance as he tries to find his political legs in Washington. And Brian, we should tell you that the Tea Party Express, without Sarah Palin, makes its way to the nation's capital tomorrow on tax day. Brian. All right, Rahima Ellis from Boston for us tonight. Rahima, thanks. And let's talk about national priorities for a minute. Last night on this broadcast, we were the first to report that an American icon, the first man on the moon, Neil Armstrong, joined some other astronauts and wrote a letter warning President Obama not to gut the manned spaceflight program. Today, the second man on the moon took the president's side. Our own Tom Costello takes it away from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Tom, good evening. Hi, Brian. Good evening to you. This has turned into a very public feud within the astronaut corps. The White House knows the esteem that the country holds Neil Armstrong in. So today, Buzz Aldrin, as you mentioned, the second man to walk on the moon, took the president's side. It's a fight over the future of America's space program, now raging inside NASA and its elite core of former astronauts. Facing steep opposition to its plan, the White House announced modifications late yesterday. Still, a